Welcome to the Muskoka Bible Center YouTube channel. We trust that this resource will be an encouragement to you as you grow in your faith. Bible teaching is at the core of what we do here at Muskoka Bible Center. So enjoy this sermon series. If you have your Bible with you, I'd love for you to open it now to Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Sound booth, can we maybe pull back on the gains? I'm getting a little bit of bounce right from up here. That'd be awesome. Thank you. We have been uh, talking all week about building a community of contrast. Some of that, of course, uh, has to do with our works, and some of that has to do with our character. And the goal here is to build and maintain a compelling community. So we want to be the fragrance of life among those who are perishing. We want to be a city on a hill. We want to smell alive when all around us are perishing. So... By the grace of God in Christ, we want to up our game. And specifically this morning, we're talking about upping our game on the matter of sexuality. Hear now the word of the Lord, beginning at verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. There's an important principle here and an urgent application, and we'll get to those things in just a minute. But before we do, I think it's important for us to recognize the underlying assumption here. Jesus is clearly operating under the assumption that adultery is a sin of maximum significance. He doesn't say, uh, be careful about adultery because it'll really complicate your life. He doesn't say, be careful about adultery because it'll really mess with your kids. Now, those things are true. But Jesus assigns an even higher significance to this issue. He says, be careful about adultery because adultery will drag your body and your soul down to hell. He says that twice in these four verses. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body body go into hell. As evangelicals, uh, I would say one of the common things we say that isn't true, or at least it isn't true enough, uh, we like to say, you know, all, all sins are equal, right? And, and usually we're saying that to push back maybe against a, a hobby horse or an overemphasis in the church. And so we'll say, you know, all, all sins are equal. But that is not true. Uh, all sins are, are equal in, in one sense in that, you know, a- any sin that is unrepented of, any, any sin that has not been taken to the, to the foot of the cross can, can sink your soul to hell. So you, even if, if you were to keep all the, all the Ten Commandments but, you know, fail on one, right, then you, then you would stand condemned before God. So th- th- there's equality in that sense. And yet not all sins are equal in terms of their significance and, and impact and and consequence. And the Old Testament goes to great lengths to help us understand that. Uh, you know, if you, if you read carefully in the Old Testament, you notice that not all sins are dealt with the same way. If you steal a sheep uh, in the Old Testament, it says you've got to pay that back four times. You've got to pay back four times the value of the sheep. There's, there are some sins where, you, you know, you, you've, you've got to confess that and take a bath and wash yourself and you're good to go the next day. And then there's other sins that are punishable by execution. That helps us understand some of this grading system. According to Leviticus 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So adultery is treated in the Bible as a capital crime. It is actually treated in the Bible in exactly the same way as murder is. Which makes sense, if you think about it, because according to the Bible, a marriage is a living thing. In Genesis 2.24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The Hebrew word there, nefesh, means soul or person. 
It's saying that the two shall become one. So when you get married, it's no longer you and me, it's us. And adultery is violence against us. And it is treated as such in the Bible. And that's why Jesus says here something very similar to what we talked about yesterday when we were talking about murder. So adultery is a big deal, brothers and sisters. And as with murder, Jesus says here, it is ultimately a matter of the heart. So that's our first important principle. We identified an underlying assumption that I think as evangelicals we're tempted to skip right over. Let's now move to a principle that we need to attend to. Adultery is a matter of the heart. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So again, you remember uh, the Sermon on the Mount, a, a lot of the Sermon on the Mount is basically a contrast where Jesus is saying, you know, you've got these leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. They're the ones you're listening to. They were the famous preachers. They're the ones everybody's downloading their sermons on the internet. Uh, and so they're, they're the ones who have tremendous influence on you. And Jesus is saying, I want you to know their way of righteousness is defective. They're, they basically deal in technicalities and lowest common denominator approaches to righteousness. And Jesus is, is saying, the way that I'm teaching is superior. It's the true way. He's saying, my interpretation of the Old Testament takes you to the heart of the matter, takes you to the intention of the Creator. And what Jesus is saying here is that the scribes and Pharisees, they're only dealing in the fruit at the end of the branch. They're only dealing with the extremity. They're only dealing with actions at the end of the branch. And I'm telling you that God is concerned with the entire system from root to fruit. And I would say, brothers and sisters, we need to hear that again in the modern-day evangelical church because our understanding of righteousness has actually sunk from the high bar set by Jesus back down to the lowest common denominator approach of the Pharisees. It is astonishing how many evangelicals think that they're not committing adultery because they would say, well, we're not, well I'm not actually having sex with my neighbor. Yeah, I may be involved in a, an emotional affair online, or I may be watching porn, but that's not actual adultery. You understand, that's exactly the bar set by the Pharisees. And, and in our heart of hearts, we know that's not very impressive. I think I mentioned that uh, my son got married last weekend. I guess it was a, a week, not this past weekend, but uh, so I guess it would be 10 or 11 days ago. And there was, you know, um, you put out these, we had a couple of these mechanisms. We had a, a Bible where people could highlight a verse and make a little note. And then we had a little sort of uh, book with pictures where you could leave a little encouragement. And, uh, and that's nice because then, you know, you can flip through that and read that and get some encouragement from all your aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and all that. Do you know what no one writes in those books as marriage advice? Nobody writes, you know, be careful not to sleep with the neighbors. You know why? Because that, I mean, that's a, that should be so obvious as to not require saying. If, if that's your bar, you know, what in the, who cares? Uh, that's not the bar. Nobody is impressed by that. No wife enters her marriage day saying, you know, I, I, I hope I've caught myself a husband who doesn't sleep with the neighbors. That's, that's not an adequate bar. Uh, we're looking for, for more than that. And that, of course, is what Jesus is talking about here. But it is amazing how widespread this, this notion is. And so Jesus is calling that out. He is saying clearly and authoritatively that adultery is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart, the eye, and the body. The whole system matters to God, just like Jesus said with murder. If contempt is growing unchecked in your heart on Judgment Day, that will be submitted as evidence of your unconversion. That's what we talked about yesterday. Now, a lot of us have a hard time hearing that. I, a lot of evangelicals, as I mentioned, have been conditioned to think that the final judgment is really a topic for the unsaved neighbor. It's not really a topic for us. When we assume that, you know, on judgment day, we'll sort of shuffle forward and our neighbors will be in front of us and they'll have a real bad go, uh, but then we'll get forward, pull out our card from our underwear that we signed, the commitment card we signed at VBS in 1982, and uh, the commitment card will go under the scanner, beep, and, and we'll just move over here and begin to enjoy uh, the glories of eternity. 
But that is not what the Bible says, right? 2 Corinthians 5.10, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. All of us. So, now you say, but pastor, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's true, but there is conversation. Are you ready for that? There's going to be scrutiny. And we know, we know that many people on that day, Jesus says, are going to get to the front of the line and discover that they were never saved in the first place. Because Jesus says, many people will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. And so how do we get there? How, how do, how, how, what, what happens? What happens, according to the Bible, is that evidence is presented. Evidence is presented. Now, not evidence that makes you saved. You don't accumulate evidence and say, oh, good, you've reached the evidence bar, you're saved. No, if you're a Christian, you, when you stand before God, evidence is presented that is supposed to bring glory to God for the fruit of your conversion. But what if there is no evidence? That's the issue. What if, they, what if they open up the trunk and say, well, let's look at your life, and there's nothing in there that indicates, there's no, there's no fruit associated with repentance. Well, that's, that's going to be a problem. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And I would say, I know that I, even today, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if after this talk, somebody came up to me and says, Pastor, I just don't like what you said there about Christians and the judgment. I just don't like that. And I, and I will very kindly say, Dear brother or dear sister, if you have a theology that has a hard time harmonizing itself with the words of Jesus, that's a problem for you. Because Christianity comes from Jesus, amen? And Jesus right here is saying, on that day, if we open up the trunk of your life and we pull stuff out, and what comes out is a giant ball of rot, of lust, and unchecked sexual aggression. If what, if what is in your heart at the very well is lustful thoughts, that's going to be submitted as evidence of your unconversion. Because that should not be in the life of a believer. You know, the Bible says, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord as though in a mirror are being transformed by one degree of glory to the next. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what the Bible says is if you're truly saved, if you've really seen Jesus as he is, not as you would like him to be, but as he is, and if his Spirit is truly in your heart, then you get two things. Forgiveness from sin immediately and freedom from sin progressively. The gospel is about more than a blank slate. It's about the power to grow and become again the person you were saved and created to be. And so if there is no evidence of that, if the trunk is opened and all there is inside is rot and corruption at the heart, what can that mean? Only one thing, that you were never saved in the first place, that the Holy Spirit was never here, because if the Holy Spirit was here, you would have grown progressively in the direction of Jesus. Can you say amen to that? That's something we almost never talk about anymore. But here it is. It's actually everywhere. It's the righteousness of faith. It's the power of the gospel. And these warnings are here to encourage us to open up. Paul says this. You should test yourself to see if you're in the faith, right? We're, we're, supposed, to, we're supposed to open the trunk and take a look and, and make sure that we see progress. Not perfection, but progress. You know, the Apostle John goes so far to say, is that, you know, anyone who's in Christ is, given, is done with sin, right? And, and so there's supposed to be progress, not perfection. Of course, we have a hard time seeing this, as we've talked about. But Jesus is very clear. If there is unchecked contempt... Resting easy in your heart on judgment day, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. That's what he says. And then here he's saying, if there is unchecked lust resting easy in your heart on judgment day, you'll be in danger of the fires of hell. Lust and contempt are, in that sense, very similar. They're both the opposite of love. Love, of course, is about cherishing another person. Lust is about taking from another person. So if that cancer is growing in your heart, then it 100% calls into question the reality of your conversion. I think many of us will be surprised to discover on Judgment Day that God does not simply take us at our word 
we think that he will. We think that we'll be able to get to the front and say, I'm a Christian. And God will say, wonderful, thank you for that. And write that down and off we'll go. That doesn't seem to square with what Jesus says. Jesus in Matthew 12 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. So it sounds like on Judgment Day, you come to the front and you enter a plea. You say, I'm a Christian, Lord. I'm a follower of Jesus. And God says, very well, then let's take a look. And some kind of tape recorder is brought forward, and it starts playing a recording of everything that you've ever said since the day you made your profession of faith. And God listens, and he is looking for evidence of the Holy Spirit's influence in your life. Did your speech, slowly but surely, begin to change in the direction of Jesus under the influence of the Holy Spirit, yes or no? Did your accusatory rhetoric and your slander and insults towards others slowly but surely begin to disappear under the influence of the love of Jesus in your heart, yes or no? That seems to be what the Bible is saying, if I'm reading that right. Nowhere in the Bible does it say simply that God will take your word for it. It sounds very much like he will examine the evidence to see if the Holy Spirit of Jesus has truly taken root in your heart. Because if the Spirit of Jesus is there, then things like contempt and lust should be on their way out. Because the Spirit of Jesus is the divine antibody that slowly but surely cures the human heart of all disease, all corruption, and all contamination. So again, if your heart is overrun with the cancer of lust or contempt, that will be submitted as evidence of unconversion on Judgment Day. I don't know any other way to read what we're reading in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, I would argue, if you have a theology that doesn't square with the things Jesus says, that's a problem for you. And unless I'm missing something, Jesus is saying here, That as in the matter of murder, so in the matter of adultery, the bar is much higher than we think, and the scrutiny will be much deeper than we anticipate. These commandments are about more than whether we kill our neighbor. They're about more than whether or not we sleep with our neighbors. The issue here is the health and purity of our hearts. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you have anger in your heart, if you have lust in your heart, then you'll have to give an account to God for those things on the day of judgment. Are you prepared for that? You better be, Jesus says. You better do everything in your power to prepare yourself for that encounter. So that's the, that's the principle. Adultery is, the, is a matter of the heart. The application, I think, that is fairly obvious The application is we need to wage all-out war on the lusts in our heart. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Tear out your eye. Cut off your hand. That's all out war. That's, that's what Jesus is calling for, right? That's hand-to-hand combat, literally. It's a serious approach. And the call that Jesus makes is echoed, picked up, and echoed by the apostles. The apostle Paul says to his people, put to death, therefore. Very similar Im- imagery. Nobody is like, you know, try your best. Um, you know, download some software on your cell phone if you can. Uh, no, like it, it's all out war, gouge out eyes, cut off hands, kill stuff, put to death. Therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is going to fall on these things. So woe unto you if they've found harbor in your heart. So make war on these things. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. We want to mortify. We used to, we used to talk about this all the time. It's only evangelicals today that struggle with this. Evangelicals today are horrified to discover that you know, my goodness, what are you talking about these things for? I said a little prayer. Um, my goodness, uh, uh, we used to write books called the Mortification of the Flesh. 
right? There were large tomes written on how to spend your whole life crucifying the lusts of the flesh. Now we're like, oh, whole life? My goodness, that sounds like works righteousness. I said the prayer, now let's move on to other things. This is a modern-day evangelical issue. We are to wage war on the lusts of the flesh. So how do we do that? How do, how do we gouge out our eyes? How do we cut off our hands, metaphorically speaking? And to be clear, it is metaphorically speaking. Uh, the church father Origen took this literally and actually emasculated himself so that he would not face sexual temptation. But that is a ridiculous misunderstanding of the passage. You, you understand that you can never take the words of Jesus too seriously, but you can take them too literally. Uh, and, and that's not helpful. And, and Jesus would occasionally rebuke the disciples for that. Remember, he would say, you know, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And the disciples would be like, ah, oh, man, we forgot sandwiches. And he's like, <laughs> no, idiots. And Jesus never said idiots, I'm sure. But he's saying, no, no, not, not literal yeast. I'm saying beware the spreading, creeping influence of Pharisaism. Because we'll push it out and it'll come right back. That's what he's saying, right? Well, she's not literally saying gouge at your eye. I, um, I, for, for several years, I did some teaching at a seminary in, um, in India. And uh, one time I was teaching a class, and there was this young fella, and he had uh, a, a white, a dead eye. And, and, and uh, I, I didn't say anything, obviously, about it. Um, but at one point, one of the other students brought it up and pointed at the fellow during tea time. That's the best thing about teaching in India, by the way. Every afternoon at 2, they stop everything and bring you tea and cookies for like an hour and a half. It's absolutely marvelous. Um, but so one time during tea, uh, one of the other students brought it up and said, this fella was he's from a village. Uh, he was a lower caste fella from the village. And he, when he became a Christian, he started reading the New Testament and got here in Matthew and literally tried to cut out his own eye with a kitchen implement. Um, and had, had, had to be restrained, and it was explained to him what, what this meant. So obviously we can, we can take that in a literal way in, in, in which it is not meant. And thankfully, um, physically emasculating yourself was uh, declared to be a sin in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea, so that's helpful for those of you uh, who may need that. But uh, uh, to be clear, this is Jesus using forceful, figurative language. He's saying, I want you to wage all-out war on the lusts and corruptions of your heart. But can I just say a quick word about that? I just, and I'm not rebuking our laughter there, because it is, it, you know. But I would I just say this. I would much rather work with a young man who took the Bible too literally, especially on an issue like this, than with a young man who takes this matter too casually. And I would say evangelicals today take this stuff way too casually. Like, oh, pastor, you're going a little over the top with the heavy judgment stuff. You know, I do have the card sewn into my underwear, so I think all of this is much ado about nothing. Uh, maybe you just need to relax a little bit. Uh, like I said, I'd rather work with a fellow who took this too seriously than with somebody who took it too casually. And I think I'd rather be that fellow on judgment day, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather say to Jesus, I, I, took this so, I actually took this too seriously, and Jesus was like, I appreciate that, and I'm thankful that you took that seriously, but obviously I'm glad you've learned uh, to understand what I'm saying. I'd rather have that conversation than the, oh, Jesus, I, didn't, I thought you were kidding. I didn't think it mattered. Um, so, and again, how, how do we do this? In the time that we have left, let me just draw your attention to some Counsel that rises, I think, naturally out of the scriptures and that has stood the test over time. First and most important thing, I think, is this. You need to deal with yourself. There's always been a temptation to make this a problem out there, meaning that it, we've always tried to solve this problem. We've often been inclined to solve this problem out in the environment, meaning if we could just, if we could put some controls in culture or in the church, if we could enforce maybe a dress code, if, if we could insist that ladies uh, wear skirts that perhaps go to the toe, uh, if, if we could do that, then perhaps we would solve this issue. But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say wage war on the environment. He doesn't say wage war on women. He says wage war on yourself. The issue is you. The issue is your heart. 
So he talks about your eye. He talks about your hand, right? He says, do what you need to do to bring yourself under management. Martin Luther picks up that theme in his commentary here. He says, therefore, Christ is a true master who teaches you not to run away from people, nor to change your place. The problem isn't your environment, but to lay hands on yourself and cast from you the eye or the hand that offends you. That is, to remove the occasion of sinning, which is the evil lust and desire that sticks in yourself and comes out of your heart. That's the issue. Far too many evangelicals want to blame the environment, want to make a big fuss about how women are dressing. They want to hide out into the woods and make everyone wear wool full body coverings, but that's not going to solve the problem. According to Jesus, the problem isn't the environment, the problem isn't other people, the problem is our heart. So we have to put the focus there. Now, is the culture corrupt? Sure. I mean, you got to prepare yourself mentally and spiritually uh, before you go to Wonderland nowadays, don't you? Sure you do. And sure, uh, sisters, is it, is it helpful and loving to dress modestly? Sure, of course. But at the end of the day, Jesus says this battle is going to be won or lost in your heart. So this is about you. It's about what you need to do. You need to apply the truth of the gospel to every spot of cancer in your heart. You need to throw open the doors to every nook and cranny of your heart. And if you do that, and if the Spirit comes in, then you will be healed. Because the gospel is not deficient. The gospel comes with power. And so the issue is really access and, and light and application. The problem is we often cover up, we often hide, we need to open, and we need through prayer and application, we need to apply the gospel to the point of the cancer. And if we do that, there will be growth. It is remarkable what happens when you simply admit the truth of what you're struggling with, when you go to God and when you go to others and when you pray and ask for gospel help, it is amazing how much growth, how much freedom you can experience over time. So we have to do that. So deal with ourselves, deal with our hearts. And then secondly, as indicated by the imagery that Jesus uses in this text, you need to guard your approaches. The Bible talks about the eye as the window to the heart. So if you want to keep your heart pure, then you have to manage your approaches. You have to manage what you see with your eye. Manage your approaches. Uh, if you know anything about geopolitics, if you watch the news, then you understand the importance of approaches. There's a war right now in Ukraine, right? You're aware of that. If you know anything about history, you know that the war in Ukraine has actually happened many times before, and should the Lord tarry another thousand years, it'll happen many times again in the future. The borders of Russia have often been further west than they are now, and they've occasionally been farther east, because that's Russia's security problem. Russia is a giant table that is, unfortunately, has three or four front doors. And so Russia often will push forward so as to close those doors. That's why there was war in uh, Georgia. That's why there was war in Crimea. That's why there's war right now in the Ukraine. Because there are several easy access points to Russian heartland through the Ukraine, through the Baltics, right, through Poland. And so Russia will often try to surge forward and, and, as it were, step through the doorway to guard the other side because it's easier to guard a door when you're standing in front of the door than it is to wait in your living room for the burglar to come to you. Now, I'm not saying anything about the righteousness of this war. That's not my point. My point is simply that when it comes to territorial defenses, everyone knows you need to guard your approaches. Well, so it is when it comes to the territory of our own bodies. You need to fight the battle at the approach is. John Stott talks a lot about this, and John Stott knew a lot about this. Not many people actually seem to know this, but John Stott lived his entire life as a celibate. He never married, never had kids. He spoke a great deal about placing moral sentries around the approaches to the heart. So he says this, what is necessary for all those with strong sexual temptations, and indeed for all of us in principle, is discipline in guarding the approaches of sin. Isn't that good? Brothers and sisters, that's a huge part of what it means to wage war on the lusts of your heart. This is what matters, but this is where the battle is fought. 
You have to be careful what you see with your eyes. The cancer of lust enters the heart through the eyes. So if we want to create a community of contrast with the culture out there in the area of sexuality, then we need to take pornography seriously within the church because it has been completely normalized in the culture. Uh, if you were here last night, we, we talked a fair bit about Jean Twenge's recent research in her book, Generations. In that book, she reports that young people see porn and masturbation as a replacement for real-world sex. Interestingly, she reports that young people today are actually having less actual sex than young people of the same age 20 or 30 years ago. They're not even trying. They're not getting married, and they're not seeking out physical relationships. I quoted a Pew Research report that came out uh, just earlier this week that said that 50% of the single men in America are not even interested in a potential physical relationship. They're all just sitting in the basement watching porn. That is a catastrophe on multiple levels. It's, it's like the gates have been thrown open and the castle completely surrendered to the barbarian hordes. There's not even an effort anymore to live above the level of an animal. Christian brothers and sisters, by the grace that God supplies, let's be better than that. Let's rediscover the beauties and the comforts of real, actual, physical, marital, covenantal sexual love. And let's fight the battle for purity at the gates. And then thirdly, following up on that, the Bible says that it's really helpful to rejoice in the permission that you're given. Rejoice in your permission. The Bible deals frankly with matters of human sexuality, and oh, how I wish that Christians did the same. It, it is bizarre to me how any time you talk about sex in a Christian context, somebody will send you an email afterwards or talk to you afterwards and just say, you know, do we really need to talk about such things in church? And you know what the answer to that is? Oh, for the love of mercy, sister, yes, we do. Do you, do you understand that our children are being bombarded every moment with the sexual values of the culture? And if there is any hope for them at all, we need to tell them what God, what the creator, what the one who made them and loved them and died for them says about human sexuality. There is nothing sinful about human sexuality exercised according to the instructions and parameters that God provides. We need to put away all the Victorian prudery. I don't even know who invented that. Uh, was Queen Victoria even this ridiculous? It's not helpful and it's not biblical. Listen, if something is in the Bible, can it be discussed among the people of God? What is in the Bible that you don't need to hear about? Nothing that I can think of. And so if it is there, it should be discussed. Frankly, not crassly. I have no interest in crassness and crudity in the house of God. But we should speak openly and frankly about whatever the Bible says. Oh, that we had more fathers who spoke to their sons like Solomon spoke to his son. He said to him, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? That's pretty good counsel right there. Solomon says to his young son, you know what you need to do, son? You need to go home and make love to your wife. Enjoy her. Enjoy her. Receive her as the gift that she is. Because maybe if you enjoy what God gave you, you'll be less inclined to fish for happiness in the sewer. That's good counsel. The Apostle Paul says basically the same thing in the New Testament. He says, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul says to husbands and wives, you should be having sex on a regular basis. Now, he says it's okay to take a break for a day or two if one of you needs to go to a prayer retreat or something like that, but then as soon as that's over, come together again quickly, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, that's good counsel. Doing that which is good and beautiful and appropriate is often a wonderful way to avoid that which is bad and unhelpful and corrosive. So rejoice in the permission you've been given. 
And moms and dads, if I could speak to you for a moment, perhaps it's time for us to stop regurgitating the wisdom of the world when it comes to getting married. Multiple times as a pastor, I've had to argue with parents who were concerned that their 20 or 21 or 22-year-old children were considering marriage when they were not yet fully established in their careers. It's a very odd perspective. They would say, well, <clears throat> they're, they're, uh, their careers aren't fully developed and, um, and their brains aren't fully developed. Uh, they might be making a terrible choice. Is it really a good time? Well, do you know what is fully developed, moms and dads? Their hormones and their reproductive capacity. And if we try to ignore nature in order to pursue wealth and worldly success, what do we get? A nation of young people addicted to pornography who have completely separated physical sexuality from fertility and reproduction. That's not helpful, but it is predictable. The average age for marriage now in North American culture is 31 for men and 28 for women. Puberty, on average, occurs at ages 8 to 13 for girls and 9 to 14 for boys. So in our current model, we are asking boys and girls to deny nature for roughly 15 years of their life. That's a big ask. Maybe we need to think through ways that we could support 20 and 20 and 21 year old kids in covenant marriage. Maybe if we let them enjoy what is good, they'll be less likely to become enslaved by that which is bad. Then lastly, however old you are and whether you are married or not, whenever and wherever the contagion of lust rears its ugly rotten head, we need to repent of it immediately, fervently, and appropriately. Your confession of sexual sin should be as broad as the sin itself. Every sin of lust is a sin against your own body and a sin against your creator. So all sexual sin should, of course, be confessed to God. But then, depending upon how far the rot has spread, some sins of lust will need to be confessed more broadly than that. If your sin of lust has spread to the point that it involved the spouse of someone else, another person, then again, you've done violence to your own marriage and you've done violence to the marriage of another. And those people will need to be included in your circle of confession. That will be painful and there may be consequences. But again, Jesus says it's better to take a bad deal in the here and now than to arrive at Judgment Day with unresolved sin on your record. If you're in a position of leadership or power over the person with whom you committed these acts, then that will need to be confessed to the authorities because that is illegal. If you are a pastor and you have had inappropriate contact with someone under your authority, that needs to be confessed to the authorities and also to your congregation. And that will be devastating, no doubt, as well. But as we talked about yesterday, again, better to deal with such things now than to have to answer for those things at the final court of appeal. Jesus said, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So we need to uncover that which has been covered. We need to open the windows. We need to open the doors and let the healing light of Jesus shine through. We need to do that for the sake of our witness. We have suffered over the last three years a tremendous blow to our witness in North America. I remember when I, I it's funny the things you remember as a kid. I remember in 1987 being in the car. I remember where our car was. We were actually going down the 400 and entering onto the 401. I remember when I heard on the radio, 1010 CFRB, about the sexual scandal involving um, Jimmy Swaggart on the radio. And I remember my, my, my mom and I discussing how this would set back our witness as Christians. Because everybody knew about Jimmy Swaggart, and it was, it, it, there was a cluster of sexual scandals. I don't know if you remember in 1987, there was the Swaggart uh, crisis, and then there was the Bakers. There was a, a cluster of these scandals that all happened in 1987, and they were being discussed on the news. 
And I, re I literally remember hearing that and thinking, I'm going to be answering for this for the rest of my life. Well, over the last three years, we had the massive Southern Baptist scandal, didn't we? And that one hit even closer to home. Because the thing with the Tammy Faye Baker and the Jimmy Swagger thing is you could say, well, that's not our group, right? I mean, that's the, those, are the, for those are the televangelists. That's, they're not even really evangelicals. They say they are, but that's just because they want your money. And, um, but what do we do with the Southern Baptists? They're our cousins. You, and if you don't know about that, you should do a little research because you'll be answering for that for the next decade at least. So we need to do better. We need to do better for the sake of our own witness, and we need to do better for the sake of our immortal souls. Oh, God, help. Let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, uh, you've taken us into deep waters this morning. You've touched on something, Lord, that we often don't like to speak about, but it's important. If we're going to be a community of contrast, Lord, if we're going to have a witness, if, if our friends and neighbors are going to peek their heads up over the fence and say, what, do you, what have you got going over there in the church, then we need to clean this up. And we can't just keep chopping at buds at the end of the branch. We need to go after the heart. And that means guarding the eyes. And that means opening the doors and letting the wind of the Spirit blow through. And that will take courage. So help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust this sermon was an encouragement to you. We have various other resources available as well including activities and retreats throughout the year that are designed to focus on growing, resilient, biblically-rooted families. Check out our website at muskokabible.com.